Today, we're going to get a little bit nutty. <laughs> So I'm gonna start out with a ch chunk of hickory. This puppy is four years old and it is equalized. It's not necessarily completely dry, but it's pretty equalized to the environment around here. Um, and this particular hickory is really strange. We'll see if this piece acts like all the other pieces I've turned from this tree. The bark thinks it's wood and the two are attached forever. It's like cement. I have no idea why it does this, um, but this particular tree has been amazing as far as the bark holding on. We'll see how that, that plays out when we turn here. What I'm going to turn is a live edge bowl, and also we've got a nice little wormhole going on there, so I don't see it coming out anywhere, so we, we might find a little friend in here. Um, We'll check that out as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the bottom portion of this. This is going to be a live edge bowl. And to mount it in the lathe, I'm going to use the, the four-point spur chuck. The little spur chuck is going to be centered in here. And to get this, to give it a really good firm grip, I need to take some of this bark off. So I'm going to do that now. So what we're doing is basically just removing some of this bark just removing some of the bark layer so that the the spur chuck will grip this really well although the bark on this like i said is incredibly hard whoa did you just see that i think there was a critter that just flew out of that hole well okay so <laughs> when i get a wormhole in some of my uh, wood pieces those will turn into beetles here. They're usually like big white grubs. They will turn into beetles when they mature. So if you look at this, this log, it is kind of, it's dropping down more on this side. And so I'm going to actually lift that side up. But the biggest part is the high points on this bowl are going to be right here. And I want to make sure those are even. And that's where the spur chuck really is helpful. I'll tell you what, I'm going to grab my tape measure. The more time we take right now to balance this and make it right the better this piece is going to be so this across the top is just about 10 inches and i'm going to mark the five inch point on there i've got the five inch point marked there i'm going to put that onto the chuck and you can see when i'm talking about this this edge that's turned at down a little bit lower i'm going to actually lift it up and start it in the chuck here now i'm going to bring the tail stock up but i'm going to keep it in here relatively loose. I'm not going to tighten it down right now. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to use the, the tool rest and I'm going to hold my thumb up against the tool rest. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for this edge right here where there is uh, between the bark and the, the sapwood. I'm holding my nail right there and I got really lucky because it's balanced on both sides. So when the bowl is complete, it's going to be it's going to be centered right on those. And if it weren't, I would loosen the tailstock and I keep adjusting it until they're both balanced out. Quite honestly, I'm really liking where it's at. So I'm going to go ahead and lock down the tailstock now. And a good idea, guys, if just to prevent yourself from hurting yourself. Don't bash your hands into, um, especially the lever locks and that. If you need to, use, use something like this to really grip it down so it's not going to come loose. Um, you can use a mallet, a rubber mallet, things like that, but don't use your hand. There's a lot of nerves and muscles and tendons in there that you don't want to be damaging your hand when you do that. I'm going to be using my 5 8 inch swept back bowl gouge. This has a 55 degree bevel on the front of it. This is kind of my go-to bowl gouge along with the half inch version of this. Now this is 5 eighths inch is the width of the total tool. The flute is half inch in this. So this is what I'm going to use to start roughing the bottom portion of this bowl blank.
pretty sizable critter activity going on down here. And I'm also at the pith. So this whole area I'm probably going to remove, which is going to minimize the amount of uh, wormholes in that. This blank is relatively deep, so I can take some of this material off, which is not a problem. And I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to shave off a bunch of this, and then I'm going to chisel off this point and then reset it. Now we're going to work off this, this connection here. I'm going to nibble this down. Basically the same way that I nibble down the tenon when I'm taking off the tenon at the end of a bowl. Okay, it's a good idea to stop here, make sure we don't have any stress or fractures in here. I've got a massive wormhole and I've got a pith. I'm gonna take a chance, I'm gonna try to take this down just a little bit more because it's gonna be a lot to, to knock off with a chisel. Let's see how this turns out. I'm definitely keeping my body out of the line of fire off to the right side here in case this comes loose and wish me luck. Well, that did exactly what I thought it was going to do. <laughs> okay, so learn from my lessons. Learn from my lesson there. So you can see what happened is that was just too much, too much pressure on that point right there, and there was a big, a big void where the worms had worked through that. Not a problem. We're going to go ahead and chisel it off. And because hickory is so nice and solid, there was no damage to that bulb blank whatsoever. Let's go ahead and chisel that off. So in hindsight, I already knew what the problem was. I should have just stopped where I was initially and chiseled the piece off just like I'm doing right now. And there wouldn't be an issue. But you guys wouldn't have learned anything if you didn't see me throw something off the lid. And I'm pretty much just gonna center it up where it was before. It won't be perfectly centered, but it'll be pretty close. All right, that gives me a nice solid area. Now, I know because I'm going to be curving this bowl back that a lot of these wormholes and things that we're seeing on the bottom will probably be removed. If they're not, that's not a big deal. It's all part of the character of the bowl. good. Uh, some fiddleback going on in here. This is tension in the tree. This tree may have been, there's one of our critters right there. We got a little worm sitting right there and still working. Four years later he's still in there working. Uh, fiddleback is basically compression where this this particular section of the tree might have had a, a branch above it that was that was cantilevered out and creating a lot of weight. So that's what we have this kind of stress mark. It was used a lot for the backs of fiddles and guitars, and it still is. Okay, I'm 
getting into the bark and I just wanted to check and make sure I'm not knocking some of that bark off and I'm not. This is acting just like the other pieces of this tree have acted which is incredible. That bark is literally fused to that wood. There's, there's other trees that I've cut down that have within a day or two the bark is like completely fallen off the tree and this this hickory this is a pig nut hickory it is very interesting how tight that bark holds on okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go ahead and shape the the tenon on this so that's going to give me that's going to define my my foot area and the base of it and then i'm going to from there because i like to create a tenon and a shoulder and that gives me lots of leeway to work with the interior later I'm going to create that and then I'm going to finish up the outside shape. In case you haven't seen it, be sure to check out my tenon video. I've got a video that shows exactly how I make my tenons. And I also have a tenon removal video, shows how to remove the tenon. Now, I've personally used the tenons and I enjoy them because they give me a lot of flexibility with the foot of the bull. I've got a lot of leeway as far as what I can create later. The shape of this tenon is relatively large, but I want a really good grip on this. I'm using my four inch jaws on this one. The bottom of this bowl will not be that large. I will reduce the size of this, but not until I'm done shaping and doing all of the turning of the bowl. Now you can see here I've established the tenon and the shoulder and now I'm going to fix this curve, take this material out right here and make this curve nicely to, to meet the top edges of this live edge bowl. clicking as I was going around the top portion of it right there. All right, everything's looking good. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to make a push cut from the top edge down because I really don't want to be making a cut going this way into the bark. Even though this is holding on super well, which you can see right here, you can see where I've cut and where it hasn't cut. It's just made this really crisp edge right here. I don't want to take a chance that if I, if I snag it here that it takes a big chunk off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a push cut in which is going against the supported grain which typically isn't the best way to turn but for a live edge bowl it's important to keep that bark on. So I'm going to make that cut now and that's going to define the other side of this curve and then I'm going to match the two. Okay, and I also see that this side is a little bit 
higher than this side. So I'm going to have to cut off a little bit more. It's going to look, it's going to little, look a little wonky there for a few minutes and then it will balance back out. So I'm going to go ahead and make this cut from the top edge down. should be able to see see I haven't cut here on this side but I've already cut on this side so I have to cut a little deeper on this side and you can see it's establishing the curve there now the other thing to keep in mind when I'm making this cut is I'm not pushing into the wood at all and I'm not really riding the bevel I'm using the bevel as a visual guide to where I should be but what I'm doing is with my left hand I'm putting pressure on the tool rest and then and just gliding on the tool rest because there's air in here, if I, if I push into the bull itself, when the, when the bull comes around, I'm going to move forward, and then I'm going to get smacked by the next piece, and I'm going to get a, real, a, a lot of vibration on there. So instead of pushing into the bull at all, I'm going to be gliding across the tool rest instead. Let's see if I've got it there. Almost. There's still a little flat spot right here that hasn't been cut, so I need to go a little bit deeper. Okay, so that shape is established. The bark's holding on just like we hoped it would. Now you can see that I have this narrower bowl inside this larger bowl. So I basically have to remove this bulk material here and continue this curve around to the, to the bottom of the piece. I've got the two high points identified and turned. Now I just have to remove this material to get down to that. And that's what we'll do right now. And one way to, one way to remove that material quickly is with a pull cut or a scraping cut and that's it's not going to be the cleanest cut but it's going to get this material down pretty quickly so that got the majority of it and i feel that the base is down where it needs to be what you what you're looking for is the the bottom of the curve and the top of the curve and now we just have to remove this material and and make a clean cut that last pulling cut is okay it's kind of like a scrape scrape cut as well because i wasn't completely on the bevel so it's not really clean so what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a nice push cut a clean push cut remove this material and make a nice connection here with the two so watch the profile of this while i'm turning Now that cut was getting too deep for this bull gouge. The size of this bull gouge doesn't allow me to get down and make that much of a cut. That's how you're going to get a catch when you overload the bull gouge. So instead what I'm going to do is nibble away this high spot. close however it's a little deeper than I would like so I'm going to bring that up just a touch looking a little bit better you see right here what I'm looking for is a really nice curve that goes from left to right and I really don't want there to be any humps in there I still have this high spot in here it's not a big deal I'm gonna go ahead and take that out right now 
The shear scrape is a great way of taking that material down. What I'm going to be doing, instead of coming at it riding the flute, or riding the bevel rather, I'm going to actually be shear scraping, which is going to be cutting right across the top of that. So I need to move the tool rest out away from the bowl, which just seems a little counterintuitive, but I really need perpendicular support from the tool rest here. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to actually have the, the butt of the tool down on my hip, and I'm going to be using the lower wing of the bowl gouge only, and I'm going to make a just sliding moves right across this curve until it, everything levels out. I, I can see you can see this black line right there. I know that there's a groove there and there's a little bit of a high spot. I'm actually watching, you see my finger at the top of the screen there? I'm actually watching this high spot right up here and I want to make that curve a little more continuous. So I'm just basically just gliding all the pressures down on the tool rest. And I'm just going here and I'm watching the top profile of that bowl. Okay, look at that shape. We've got a nice curve. It's going all the way across. Let me move the tool rest. It's going from the from one edge across to the bottom edge. Nice smooth curve. Okay, for what I'm gonna be doing right now, I'm gonna actually use the tailstock to brace this just a bit, because I'm gonna be pounding on this in just a second. All right, now I have to decide where I wanna put our little accent feature in here. Okay, so I think I'm going to, I don't wanna center our accent right at a center point of the, of the bowl. I wanna make it offset, and I'm thinking right here is gonna be our location. All right, go into my bucket of pig nut hickories, hickory, pig nut hickory nuts. I guess that's kind of redundant, pig nut hickory nuts. What I want to do is I want to find one in here that doesn't have its husk on it. If the husk is on it, that potentially could break apart. This one's actually really nice right here. Okay, I think that's going to be our candidate. Okay, so it's almost an inch. It's a little over an inch on the width. And it's right at an inch. So I'm going to need something that's going to be an inch and an eighth is going to be too wide. I'm going to try it at an inch and we're going to try to derive it in there from there. <laughs> All right, so we've got an inch diameter Forstner bit for our pig nut hickory. Okay, so I'm going to keep this perpendicular to the surface of the bowl. And what I want to do is I want to try to get the windows that are going to be exposed kind of in line with the grain here. So you can see that, that little line going through the nut. So I'm actually going to try to line that up here with this. I'll try my best with that. Essentially, it's a very tight fit, and I'm going to be driving that in with a mallet. What I'm hoping for here is to essentially open up this opening a little bit wider so it'll receive that shape a little bit better. I think that's going to work a little bit better. Let me get a little bit of glue in there. There it goes. Yeah, I just needed to spread it a little bit wider. Now I want the widest part of this nut to be making up that window. 
and I'm saying I'm gonna say it's it's just about there I'm not gonna move it anymore now, I do have some voids around here what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually use around the the lathe there's some really fine dust I'm going to pack that into those and then I'm gonna put some glue on top of that And then I'm going to pack some more shavings into that. Now, of course, I'm going to turn this outside, and this is all going to be nice and smooth before I'm completed with this, the exterior of that. I think that's going to be really good for right now. Let's let that dry real good. The nut has had plenty of time to dry and is completely cured there. Now, if I were to turn this and hit that with a bull gouge, there's a good chance it's gonna go flying back out of there and cause a nasty catch. So instead of using the bull gouge, I'm gonna use my 80 grit gouge here and an 80 grit disc on this to lower the surface of that nut. It's getting down into the into the flesh of the nut. It's pretty cool. You can see the different uh, the meat inside the nut there itself. Uh, I still want to take it down. It's ra it's up about a quarter inch above the surface. I want to take it down at least another eighth of an inch. So I'm going to continue sanding that. All right, this is looking really cool. I've got it lowered pretty pretty well. I'm really happy that the center line of the division in the windows of the meat of the nut is parallel with the rim that I was shooting for that. I'm going to leave that meat in there because it's going to help hold these little delicate areas in the center. At the very end, once I'm done turning both sides and everything sanded and all that, I will go ahead and take those out. But for right now, I'm going to leave those in. I want to line this up and make sure that I've got a uh, good reinforcement. I've already knocked a little chip out of there. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I know that this bull gouge has just been sharpened. It's got a really nice fresh cut on it. I'm actually going to make a push cut across that and try to clean that up first before we go any further. Try to make a light cut across that. Now I'm using a shear scrape here because I just want to subtly move through and clean up these curves. We've got a little bit of a high spot right here that needs to be cleaned out as well. To get to that, I need to move the tool rest. And I've got a big high spot right there. I think before I go any farther, I'm going to go ahead and fill that right now. So what I'm going to do is around the lathe, if you look really close, there's a little really fine dust. And well, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll take that back. I'm going to spray this lacquer first. Put a little lacquer on it, it's going to prevent the CA from staining it too much. What that's doing is just closing up the pores of the cells around here so it won't, it won't soak up the CA quite as bad and create a stain. A lot of times on the, the tool rest, at the base of the tool rest, you'll find dust down there that's got, uh, that's super fine. Like sitting up here underneath the post of the tool rest is usually some really nice fine dust. Just go ahead and use that. Okay, I'm going to apply some CA really quickly at the base of this first. And I didn't want it to run quite that far. I'm going to turn the lathe around. I'm going to take this down here so that it doesn't... Actually, I'm going to do it on the opposite side so that it doesn't drip down into the meat of that nut. Hit that with a little accelerator so it dries fast. And then I'm going to continue shear scraping this. Okay, that's smoothed out really well. 
and I'm happy with that. Now I'm going to sand this whole outside. Because I've got all these wormholes in here with the the debris behind them, I'm going to go ahead and put a layer of shellac on. This is um, a one pound cut of shellac. So it's very thin and it's going to soak in and it's going to help hold some of those things together. If you want to know how to make this shellac, check out the link up at the top of the screen right now. I've got a video that shows how to make your own shellac from scratch. It's actually very simple only two ingredients and there's a good reason why you want to have shellac around in your shop. Go ahead and watch that video and check that out. Wow, look at this. Look at the uh, fiddleback coming out now that the uh, there's a little bit of a shine on this has been sanded smooth. I love turning this hickory. It's just gorgeous wood. And there's our nut. It's looking really good. Okay, so I'm going to remove the tailstock, get that out of the way, and I'm going to start in right on this edge. I'm going to determine the wall thickness and get that moving, and we'll start working that wall down. Okay, so I've got my wall thickness established. I'm going to go just a touch thinner. I'm going to clear some more material out of this area and then start reducing that wall. And in just a short bit, I'm going to be able to see the other side of that nut and we'll be leveling it out as well. The excess amount of dust are these wormholes basically exploding on me as I'm opening this up. The uh, excavated areas from the worms. So if you see here, I've got a little bit thicker area. I'm going to go ahead and uh, move the tool rest in so I've got a little bit more support. I'm going to narrow that just a little bit. And we've got the base of the tool of the nut is starting to be exposed there. I don't want to take too big of a bite off at once because I don't want to hit the bottom of that nut uh, with the dramatic force. Okay, if you can see here, I'm down to the level of that nut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in here, I'm going to readjust the tool rest, and then just gradually nibble away this material and take that nut down from the inside here. top of that nut. Let's see what that's looking like. All right. Well, there's the nut and we're taking off the top of it. It's looking good. I just got to keep moving the wall down.
My goodness, this thing is dusty. Well, there's the back side of the nut, and everything is in place, looking good. I might have a little bit of an edge to fill, like on the other side, but that's okay. It's looking real good. All right, I'm just going to continue down, and we'll keep turning out the inside of this bowl. This hard hickory is creating a lot of friction, so this bull gouge is dulling very quickly. So we got to bring it back to the sharpening station and sharpen it up. Now, if you want to learn more about sharpening, be sure to check out my tool sharpening for wood bull turning e-course, which is available right now. Go to the link in the description below and check that out, or go to my website, turnawoodbull.com, and click on courses. This is a 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. And this is kind of my go-to bowl gouge. And I talk all about this and explain how to make this as well as four other bowl gouge profiles, how to shape them and how to sharpen them. So go check that out. Because I've got the, I've got the depth down to where I need. I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to do a shear scrape here and smooth this out, and then really shape the foot, and then we'll take out the bottom interior of the foot. Thinking about that void from the wormhole earlier, which we have one right here, I need to be really careful one, that I've got plenty of support on this nub here while I'm turning this foot. I'm going to keep slowly making delicate scrapes in here 
and get this all shaped. Switching to my spindle detail gouge here. If you want to know the difference between a bull gouge and a spindle gouge, check out the link on the screen above. Now again, I want to make sure there's no big wormholes or voids that are giving me lack of support. It seems to be okay there. That's thin enough. I'm going to kill power and apply pressure until we get it to sever. Man, that's hardwood. All right, we'll work that off and sand it here. See what we can do. There it is. All right, so then I'll sand that off. All right. Here comes the big reveal time. We get to start pushing the meat out of this nut. See, we have a window to revealed. Look at the oil coming out of that. It's interesting. Just going to take my time here because I know there's some middle parts of this that are pretty delicate. Don't want to force it and break them now after all of that turning and taking the time to make sure that it stays as intact as possible. It's slow going. You would think this would just pop out, but I, like I said, I don't want to force it. And it's good that it was in there because it definitely wouldn't have, the little center part would not have held up without the support of the material in the middle of that during the turning and sanding. There it is. Okay, I'm going to put a nice coat of shellac on this to help seal the inside and coat it and protect it. And this is also good for the bark. I'll actually start up on the bark edge, let that coat that nicely. This is very thin shellac, so it runs down nice. I don't want to get it too thick in here, so it puddles. Nice. How cool is that? There's our, our, there's our hickory nut window in the side of this bowl. I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit on the back side as well after that's been sanded. And the foot. And then uh, this will get a final coat of lacquer, but the, the 
shellac is designed to seal this and protect it and keep any of that the loose material in those worm tunnels i want to keep those intact at this point there you have it this is a live edge hickory bowl with all kinds of wormholes and pass in it and a hickory nut a hickory nut in the side wall of the bowl itself and now you know how that's made so if you like this video, click the like button, subscribe, all that good stuff, and leave me a comment. What do you think of this? Is this something you would try? Do you guys have any um, nut-producing trees that you could, you could replicate this where you live? Leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. And like I always like to say, until next time, happy turning.